Welcome back into the Illini Enquirer podcast and happy to have on an old friend as uh, Illinois is celebrating a 20 year reunion of back to back Big Ten championships. Yeah, about 20 years ago, kids, Illinois had one heck of a run in the Big Ten. Former Illini Sean Harrington is joining me now. And Sean, I can't wait for you to get back up to Champaign. Uh, I know you're down in Florida enjoying the weather uh, you have down there, but it sounds like there's going to be a good crew, you guys. Corey Bradford, Frank Williams, Sergio McClay, Marcus Griffin, Lucas Johnson, Demir Kabaya, uh, all these guys. Um, th- and those are great teams. I, I want to talk to you about the new the team that's going on now, but um, well-deserved honor for, for teams that kind of get – lost in the shuffle sometimes of the, the final line I and, the, and that 05 team. Yeah. I mean, when you got a guy flying in from Bosnia, you know, that that's pretty special. So, um, you know, we were, we were a close group, uh, you know, went through a lot on the court, obviously had a lot of success as a team. Uh, we feel very proud and uh, of what we did in our four years and kind of felt like we were the springboard for that 05 team. And, you know, they kind of went off of our tails there and, and obviously did a terrific job those next couple seasons as well. So um, we take a lot of pride in that, thinking that we kind of set the foundation for, you know, what I kind of argue is the best maybe six, seven-year stretch in Illinois basketball history. When you look at, you know, five different Big Ten championships in that stretch, uh, deep runs into the NCAA tournament. Uh, I don't know if we were ever lower than a four seed kind of in those, uh, you know, six, seven years. So a lot of great players, a lot of great teammates. Um, you know, it's going to be a blast to catch up with those guys. We got some text threads and things like that going that we all kind of stay in touch, but it'll be a lot of fun to get together in person, share a lot of stories and then get together and watch a game. You know, we haven't done this uh, it, it, forever, really. I mean, when you, when you talk about, we're going to have eight, nine, 10 of those, you know, at least 13 players from that team to be able to sit down, watch a game in the state farm center where we made a lot of memories. It, it'll be really cool to catch up with all those guys. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of those guys haven't seen the arena since it's been renovated, Sean. Um, and and to have the team back, you know, obviously not uh, maybe as good early on here with all the injuries and stuff, but to have a good team too, I think that's got to be a pretty cool thing because, I mean, you guys kind of brought, right, Illinois back to where it was after all the, the NCAA sanctions coming out of the, the, the Deion Thomas NCAA thing. Uh, you guys got it back to where it was, and really um, you guys were a big part of – Illinois basketball having the expectations it has, the sky high expectations it has now. Yeah. I mean, when we were playing, we felt like you didn't even talk about the NCAA tournament because that was a given, you know, we weren't talking about, do we make the tournament? We were talking about what seed are we going to get? And, you know, our goal every single year was to win the big 10 while we were there. And it was a realistic goal. And, you know, we were right there, uh, you know, got it two of the four years. And then the third year won a big 10 championship in the tournament, Uh, fell a game short of Wisconsin in the regular season. So, Winning three out of four in those years, we mentioned never being lower than a four seed. You know, that, that's what we expected. That's what we, we wanted to do. Um, and, and now you're seeing that again, you know, this year. And, and, it, and it's kind of cool to think they've dropped a few games here. And in years past, we've been like, well, there goes the season. Now you got to basically win the Big Ten tournament because you just dropped your big non-conference games that you could have made a statement. Now you're a bubble team. That's not the case with this team, right? They dropped a few games. It's no big deal. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to be really good moving forward. Uh, but that, that's a really good feeling as a fan to not say this game in December cost us our NCAA tournament because we're a bubble team. And it's not the case with this team. That's how we were when we were playing. You knew we were going to be in the NCAA tournament was what seed, how far could we go? Could we win a Big Ten championship along the way uh, before the NCAA tournament got going? Yeah. So let's talk about this team a little bit, Sean. 2000-2001 third winning us in program history, 27 and eight overall, 13 and three in the big 10. You get a share of the big 10 title, you advance the elite eight, but take me through before that season. Cause I, you guys knew you were going to be pretty good with everything uh, you returned, but Lon Kruger leaves for the NBA in May, right? Take yeah. me through what that was like as, as a player on that team. When you guys had sky high expectations after Lon had done such a good job of kind of turning this program around. Yeah. I mean, complete shock to be honest because it was so late when it happened um you know we're back home we just finished school we just finished workouts you know the 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 season the uh the school year ends and we get to go back home for two or three weeks before the summer school session starts back up and we all come back and, and that's how we find out about the news so um you know, and that day, obviously it's not Twitter, you know, you don't have the social media that we had. So we got phone calls and it, it was a shocking phone call uh, from coach Kruger to kind of hear that and to hear that he was taking the job. And, 
Um, you know, obviously at the time, selfishly, you want him to come back because you do have a good thing going. Uh, but I really do believe it worked out well for us. It worked out well for the program. Black Ruger did a great job of uh, getting fundamentals with our guys, getting really good talent on that team. And then when Bill Self comes in, everyone has to prove themselves. You know, we kind of had our role with Lon Kruger. It was You kind of knew who was going to start, who was going to come off the bench, who was going to get those minutes, the style of play we were going to play. So when Bill Self came in, it was just an all-out war of, like, who's going to get those starting spots? You know, who's going to get the minutes? We all felt like this was our chance to maybe, if you didn't like the path that you were on, you could change that. If you liked where you were sitting, you had to prove yourself all over again because, uh, you know, the coaches were getting fresh eyes on you. And that was the deepest team that I'd ever been around. It was the most physical team I had ever been around. Uh, and our practices showed that. It, it, it was, I mean, top five going against next top five, everybody going after it. The most competitive practices I had ever been around were in those kind of three, four years, um, you know, in that stretch there. And that's how we played. We played tough. We played physical. Uh, teams didn't like playing against us. Um, you know, because of that physicality, uh, you know, we, we could tell all kinds of stories, but I remember we played a game, um, and, and afterwards you can guess who uh, makes a comment in the paper and it's Lucas Johnson, obviously. So we're all sitting in, in the, the video room and coach self walks in and he's got a newspaper in his hand and he just kind of opens it up and he starts reading a quote. And as soon as he starts reading it, we all look at Lucas and be like, why did you do this? But the quote was basically like, we're so bad that the other teams cross the street when they see us coming down the road because they don't want to go on the same side of the road as us. So it was basically how tough we are and everything. And Coach Self basically said, all right, you guys said it. Now we got to go do it. And that was, that was the mentality. We were a physical team. We loved it. Um, and that, that was a lot of fun. And, and I'll put us up against anybody in the last 20 years physically uh, trying to match that team. I mean, you look at this front court for people who didn't see this, John, uh, 6'11, 250, Robert Archibald, right? Um, Lucas Johnson, 6'8, 230. Jameer Kupai is 6'9, 230. Brian Cook, 6'10, 240. Serge is 6'4, 230. We all know he's basically a power forward in a point guard's body there, but like Marcus Griffin, 6'9, 235. Like you guys could just throw waves and waves of, of front court players. People. Yeah, absolutely. And even you look at our backcourt, you know, you know, Frank is six, three, you yeah. know, Corey Bradford, six, three. And, you know, then I'm coming in, I'm six, two, six, three. So we didn't have anybody under six, two that was even playing on the floor at any time. Um, you know, so it was, it was just, it was, it was a physical team. We came in waves. Um, we were very, very deep, you know, and so it was obviously the game that got us was Arizona at the end and foul trouble. You can't overcome. I want to say it was 36 fouls and 50 written down six free throws or something like that. So you couldn't overcome that many fouls. But we didn't, we didn't struggle with foul trouble. We didn't struggle if one guy could get hurt because we had so many bodies that could come in there. And, um, you know, we took a lot of pride in that. When it was your number was called, you, you, you stepped in there and you, you could contribute to the team. And, uh, you know, that, that just talk about the depth of that team. And, um, you know, I'm sure you might have some other questions too, but it's, it's the only Final Four I've never watched since I was born and can remember was that season. And it was because we believed we should have been there. We believed we could have won it, and I just couldn't fathom watching it. And you look at those four teams that made the Final Four. Arizona, we beat in Chicago that year. Maryland, we beat in Maui that year. Michigan State, we beat in Champaign that year. And Duke was your national championship. We lost to them by one in Greensboro, and I think we had 30 turnovers. So it was one of those games where, like, if we don't turn the ball over 25 times, we probably win that one. And so we really felt we played all four of the final four teams. We beat three of them. And the one we lost to was the national champ. And like I said, we lost by one point in a game where we didn't play a, a, our best ball and had 30 turnovers in it. That might have been the greatest non-conference schedule in our <laughs> history. I mean, you guys played UNLV, Maryland, and Arizona in Maui. Maryland, as you said, was six in the country. You play Duke in the Big Ten ACC Challenge, lose by one. Play Seton Hall at home, yeah. right? They were number yeah. seven. You play Arizona again at yeah. United Center, the second of three times that year. Yeah. And then you play Missouri, obviously beat them yeah. in overtime, and at Texas. Yeah, you, you guys, once you got to Big Ten play, I mean, you knew you were pretty good, but you were tested. Right. And, and I mean, it, it was as a player too, 
it was the most fun season you could ever be a part of because yeah. that's what players want. They, they, they're looking, what's the next big time game? You know, what's the next one? Well, it was the next game on the schedule. I mean, it really was like uh, next game up. You hear the coach speak. We only think about the next game. Well, that was the truth with us because there was nothing to look ahead to. It was like, we got another powerhouse coming in here. Um, it, it was the most fun season I've been, ever been a part of from start to finish. Because you start it in Maui, which is the tournament that everybody watches growing up as a kid, right? You want to go to Maui. You want to be a part of that. So we go there, play three unbelievable uh, games in that atmosphere. Uh, you mentioned, you know, then the opponents that you play leading up the rest of the non-conference. Uh, then you get in the Big Ten play, win your first Big Ten championship as a player. Um, you know, so that's a special experience. Then you make uh, a deep run in the NCAA tournament, get all the way to the eight. So you talk about start to finish. It was just so much fun. There was so much excitement. Uh, I believe that was the year of the first paint the hall orange. Uh, it's car- kind of hard to even imagine the hall not having everybody decked out in orange. And but that was the truth. A lot of people wore blue, white, gray, and you know there was orange mixed in there. But to think that we never had a, a hall that was orange before that season, um, you know, it was just so many special things happened in that year uh, that we look back on and have great memories of. And it went over Kansas. Right. Um, in, in the uh, sweet 16 to, to get to the elite eight. What, what did you think of playing Arizona a third time in, in a season? What, what a, what a weird coincidence on the schedule and uh, obviously a great team. I mean, they, they were absolutely loaded that season. Um, you know, Gilbert arenas, Jason Gardner, Richard Jefferson, Michael Wright, Lauren Woods, um, obviously uh, two great teams going at it three times. Yeah. And, you're used to it in conference, right? You're, you'll play a team twice. You meet them again in the Big Ten tournament, something like that. So it wasn't weird to play a team three times. Obviously, you mentioned the weird thing was it's a team out in the West Coast. And, yeah, you know I mean, it's you really don't hear a lot about during the season. You know, just the West Coast teams, you don't hear much about them when, when the season gets going. Those games are usually later. But by that time, I mean, we know them, we knew them so well. <laughs> it was just like it felt like it was kind of a conference game. It felt like it was a drag out, you know, Big Ten type atmosphere. And, um, and you mentioned that team was absolutely stacked. You know, I mean, you talk about a team that's, that's talented and, um, you know, we, uh, um, you know, played them really hard three times, got one of them, you know, probably didn't get the one that counted the most and that would have got us to the final four. Uh, but, you know, a lot of respect for that team. You know, you can't hang your head for losing to a team that ends up having, you know, four guys on it. I think that go and win NBA champ- or three guys that win NBA championships, guys that are NBA all-stars. Uh, so, you know, no shame in that, but we we still felt like we were the better team. We felt like we just didn't play our best in that one. Um, you know, and obviously we mentioned, I think the, uh, the 56 free throws that they go and shoot, you know, some of that is us being physical and that was the way we played and we needed to adjust to the the way the game was being called. Uh, but that, that one's hard to swallow when, when your opponent shoots 56 free throws. And again, you're within striking distance of a possession or two to win that ball game. Um, but yes, that definitely, uh, an unbelievable team. And, uh, I posted on Twitter the other day a little story of, uh, uh, you know, what Coach Billy Gillespie did for the scouting report on that team. And we knew him so well. We knew how talented they were. And uh, so he went down the line. And instead of having tendencies on the board for how we're going to stop guys and how we're going to do everything, he just wrote soft in all capital letters under every single guy. And, and it was just that was our mentality that year. It really was. And, um, you know, and obviously we respected them. It was it was kind of a joke, but it wasn't a joke. That was our mentality going into that ball game. Um, and, uh, you know, another really good story from that one, that season, it was the game before. So it's going into Kansas for the Sweet 16 game. Uh, and I remember, you know, the TV people are at the game, you know, the, the analyst color guys, all that. So they're at practice, you know, trying to, you know, get their, their scoop and their, and their stuff. And so we started, you know, did a few stretching drills, a couple uh, warm-up drills. So we're about 10 minutes in the practice, time to go live. You know, we're only going to go maybe an hour and a half. That's, you know, day before a game kind of a thing. So it were five minutes into that practice. There was a loose ball. And I kid you not, seven to eight guys dive on this loose ball. I mean, it is an absolute just scrum on the floor. And Coach Self just blows the whistle. He goes, we're done. He goes, go get a few shots up if you need them. He's like, we're ready to go. And and that was it. We literally had a 15, 20-minute practice the day before Kansas. And the TV guys were like, that's all you're going to do? You know, they were asked, what's going to do? He goes, if my team's doing that, nothing else matters for the next hour of what I could get them to, you know, kind of feel and what kind of they could do. They are as mentally ready and prepared as they can be for this game. And we went out and just played a very good Kansas team and controlled that game from start to finish. And it just kind of showed the mentality of that team and, and how tough we were and how ready to play we were. 
obviously Lon Kruger is going on to have potentially a Hall of Fame career. Uh, Bill Self has become a Hall of Famer. Wh- when did you know that this guy is, is I mean, obviously he had a good time at Tulsa. It was really good there. But when did you know he was a special coach? Probably in that first season, you know, did, did I know he was going to win that many games, you know, or as many as he did, maybe not that, that he could arguably be one of the top five coaches when you really kind of break it down, if he can win another championship here or two, I mean, he's going to be in that conversation with the coach K's and the, uh, the Roy Williams and, you know, those types of guys. Um, but you could see, you, you could just kind of see the way he interacted with us. Uh, you could see the way that he got us to play hard uh, he had a very good um, way of getting on you hard in practice and then just kind of putting his arm around you afterwards. And you felt like, okay, he was on me because he cares. He was on me because he wants us to, to play, uh, you know, tougher and harder. And, um, you know, he, he knows we could be better than what we're playing at that time. So just a great relationship with his, with his players uh, that you felt like you wanted to play hard for him. Um, and then he's underrated as an X and O's coach. You know, that's that one thing is everyone just says, well, he's got the best talent year in, year out. And, you know, I don't think that's the case. They got really good players at Kansas every year, um, but they don't have the best. When you break it down, you know, Duke's got better players half the time. Kentucky's got better players than them half the time. Uh, but Carolina might have better players than them. But look at those three programs. They've all had a dive. They've all had a season or two where they didn't make the NCAA tournament or they didn't have a good season. It hasn't happened to Kansas. So he's just not getting the absolute elite and he's just running out there. He does a really good job X's and O's. Uh, So I think he doesn't get the credit probably for that. Um, You know, and and you can even look at our team. He joked all the time. He says, I had more talent and more athletes at Tulsa than when I came and saw you guys out there on the floor. But, you know, he was able to get us to play, uh, you know, physical. He was able to play tough. Uh, and obviously he was joking with us and, and we had great players on that team, but um, you know, it wasn't just like we were loaded with all, McDonald's all Americans and guys that went on and became NBA all-stars in that season either. Sean, I'm sure you've felt this, but like obviously D Brown's an icon. Everybody adores. I would assume it is kind of the same way, but there's a different way that people talk about Frank Williams. Like, yeah. like that he, people grew up in that era. Like our friend, Mike Carpenter just loves Frank. He was kind of the star when Frank, like when he was growing up watching Illinois basketball, what is it about Frank that, that people were just drawn to or, or give me your best Frank Williams story that kind of tells why he was such a special player? Yeah, and I think um, we all appreciate what he did on the court. And I think Illinois fans did as well. But he didn't, he, his play had flash. He wasn't a guy that was in the media and you heard him, his, the personality kind of come out. So I almost feel like there was like this mystical, like feel around him. Like <laughs> I, everyone kind of feels like they know D Brown, right? I mean, he's not, you know, he's popping the Jersey. He's got the headband. He's got, you know, uh, the mouthpiece that's colored orange and blue, uh, you know, I O very outspoken. Obviously I know social media has completely changed the game here recently and, and people get a much better feel for the athletes uh, it, now in this kind of era. Uh, but I feel like they, they know those two guys. I feel like there was like a mystique around Frank. Like, what's he like? You know, how is he? But everyone loved his game. You know, he, I always said he kind of glided out there. And it was almost one of his knocks was like, he doesn't play hard all the time. And like, you know, he's playing hard. He's just that smooth that it looks like he's not trying. Uh, you know, he saw things uh, that everyone can't see. You know, he, he, he made passes that you'd go back on the film and be like, how did he see that? How did he know that was going to be open? Um, you know, for, for the younger generation, go Google the Frank Williams show versus Iowa. If you Google Frank Williams show versus Iowa, you're going to see plays that you are just mind blowing that he did that in a game. Um, so the way that he played was spectacular and he didn't say much. He was fun to be around. He was energetic around us, but he wasn't going to go out in the media and, and, and say things. And, um, but he had a way of, um, kind of lightening the mood when we needed it you know he, he would make a joke and, and he'd be funny um but he played so you know he, he was so good that we wanted to jump on with him you know we wanted him to we knew he was the guy who was going to carry us but you wanted to play with him he was fun to play with um so he kind of had that feel to him and um you know just you know it was one of those where i think it was uh, I want to say it was the Seton Hall game. I want to say it was Seton Hall that year, and he had a bad first half, and we were down a lot, 15 to 20 at halftime. I mean, it was 15 to 20 to half. 
he didn't play well. And I remember, you know, coach self just went, went into him, you know, and we just need more out of Frank and Frank, you're just, you're not here today. You're not, you know, wanting to be a part of us kind of a thing. Um, but then Frank goes out and has the half of a lifetime, you know, and then he comes back in the locker room and kind of gives it right back to coach self. Like you want to jump on me now kind of a thing. And we all just died, you know, on that locker room that, you know, coach gets up there to give a speech and then he's going to give it kind of right back. And that, that's, that was Frank, you know, like he was just, um, uh, you know, he, he, he was able to just turn it on in the biggest of moments, um, you know, hit big shots when we needed them to, but I do feel like there was that little mystique around them that everyone didn't quite know who was Frank Williams, but man, could he really play? Lucas Johnson is the AJ Pierzynski of Illinois basketball, right? Like, yeah, yeah, love him on your team, but man, every other person had to hate playing against him. What did he bring to that team, Sean? He was the toughness. I mentioned earlier, he, you know, he brought the, you know, the quotes to the paper, you know, where, People didn't think they knew Frank. They knew exactly who Lucas Johnson was. You know, he wasn't afraid to say what was on his mind. Um, you know, he was outspoken. He had a great personality. Um, you know, he probably was a lot of Illini fans' favorite player from that from that uh, era uh, because of exactly what you said. You, you love to have a player on your team like that who does the dirty work, right? He's going to get in there. He's going to get under people's skin. He's going to get in there. He's going to, you know, grind it out and get physical with the other team's best player. He doesn't care who it is. He doesn't care if it's their biggest guy. He doesn't care if it's their point guard. Um, so, you know, he, he kind of would always do those kinds of things. Um, you know, there's been, I don't think there's ever been somebody that has been lifted up on the crowd's shoulders after scoring two points in the ball game. And it wasn't a ba- it wasn't a game winner. And, and, and that was uh, the paint the hall orange game against Michigan state and, and the crowd comes out and rushes and he gets lifted up somehow. We still to this day don't know how Lucas Johnson scoring two points in the game against Michigan state. And it wasn't a buzzer beater. We win by eight to 10 points. How does he get lifted up on everyone's shoulders and kind of get carried off? And did he tell them to we, do it? Did he tell them to do it? Like, hey, put oh, me- I'm sure he did. Yeah. I'm sure he did. He told everybody to lift me. It's that's, that's what we claim. He says, no, he was, he was claiming he was yelling at everybody to put me down, put me down. But we know that wasn't the case. So, um, but yeah, it's, you know, he had a great personality, he had that toughness, that mean streak, um, you know, couldn't be a nicer guy off the court. Yeah. I mean, like it was, the, it's the nicest guy off the court and then he gets on the court and you just can't believe, you know, kind of the way he plays and how physical he is. And, uh, you're right. Every Illini fan loves him. Every other fan of the big 10 absolutely hates him. And, and, you know, we've all got those guys in the big 10 that we can't stand because they're not on our team, but you'd love to have them on your team. And that was Lucas. And this was really the golden era of central Illinois basketball, right? I mean, and the connections you guys had on that team with Marcus and Sergio from, from Peoria, obviously Brian cook comes in as a freshman as your second leading scorer uh, out of Lincoln, Illinois, obviously you had Jarrett and Brett Melton on that team as well. Brett from Muhammad and Jarrett's from Peoria. Um, obviously Marcus and, and Sergio were a big part of that team. And Brian was too. Like what, what did those guys mean to that team? Yeah. And you know, there's, there's something about like a pride when you're playing for your home school, your home state. And, you know, I, I definitely felt like that team felt it. And, and you talk about, I mean, the majority of the guys were in state, you know, I mean, it's Corey's out of state and Demir's, you know, from Bosnia, but he ended up playing at Rockford, you know what I mean? So it was even while he was here, um, you know, his whole life is in Bosnia, but his high school days are uh, in the state of Illinois as well. So, um, you know, I, I, there, there's a sense of pride there. And, I, I love basketball. I'm, I'm probably the next level of, you know, I would get excited to go to Champaign as a seven-year-old to watch the IHSA because that was, you know, the dream of playing in that. And that's most kids probably don't want their spring vacation to be going to the IHSA state title, you know, but that was me. And I watched those Peoria teams, you know, and I, and I idolized, you know, some of those guys and uh, you're talking about the Jerry Hesters, right. You know, and those guys that came out of there. And then, um, you know, I was a couple of years younger than, uh, Marcus and Serge and a year younger than Frank. So I idolize that manual team. You know, I'm a sophomore in high school and I'm like, these guys are just, you know, the studs, they are legit. Like, that's who I want to be. You know, that's, that's who you want to, uh, you want to get down state and win like they did. So, um, you know, they, they were the backbone of that team. You know, you got that Peoria pipeline with those three guys and with Frank and, and Griff and, and Serge. And, you know, so growing up watching what, how good Illinois basketball is in the state of Illinois high school wise. Uh, and then to bring a lot of those guys together then on a team, it's, it's a big sense of pride and, and you want to do it for the state. And, 
you know, the, the community of Champagne is, is terrific. And so like you get to know them extremely well and uh, you want to do well for them and you want the fan base to be able to have something that they can enjoy and, and really wrap their arms around it. And I felt like we did that. And uh, there always is a sense of pride when those players are coming from within state. Yeah. And the next year, Sean, you guys back it up and, and do it all again. The first team in 50 years to win back to back shares of the, the big 10 title. You guys go 26 and nine, 11 and five, what a four way share, five way share. Yeah. yeah it was four for sure. You yeah. it may have been five. Yeah. Yeah. So four way share of the, the big 10 fourth most wins in, in a season in Illinois history. I mean, back to back years that, it just doesn't happen all that often. You guys advance to the Sweet 16, lose to Kansas that year, but um, you lose Lucas, Sergio, uh, and, and Marcus, but um, or you didn't lose Lucas, but you get Luther Head yeah, coming in. Yeah, injury wise with Lucas. Yeah. yeah. And then you get Luther Head coming in, you get uh, Brian Cook. How did that team change uh, with, with Serge and Marcus going? Yeah, in new roles. You know, we, and that's, I think a lot of times people see a team that has so much back, they just expect it to take off kind of where it left off. And, uh, you know, you had, you had to get some new roles and, and we mentioned, you know, Griff, just how great player he was inside and Serge kind of uh, that forward position kind of had that locked down and, and Lucas had the ACL. So, I mean, like he's out for a lot of it. A lot of people don't realize how hurt Demir and Arch were uh, in that season. So, you know, that is a team that, you know, as exciting as the first one was and how great that season maybe was looked at for us to put together the season that we had, with losing Griffin Surge and then losing Lucas to an injury and then having the injuries to Demir and Arch. I mean, we just named five guys that, you know, really weren't themselves, but lost two of them because they were seniors. And then three guys because of injuries really weren't themselves that season. So uh, we put a great season together. Uh, and then that next year, everybody's got the target on your back, right? We, maybe we snuck up on a few people the year before, but we weren't sneaking up on anybody the next year. We were taking everybody's best shot. Uh, every time we went on the road, it was sold out. Um, you know, so teams wanted to come in and beat us because we've got a streak going at home. Uh, you know, something we're really proud of. We were 52 and uh, 51 and two in those four years. It was the best four year stretch of a home record um, in college basketball. We put it on our, on our rings that year. It says defend the hall 51 and two. So to take the pride that nobody was going to come in and beat us, um, you know, that next year, it was a grind. That one was a grind. And, and it was like, piecing together practices, piecing together lineups at times. Who are we going to have really at full strength in that one? Um, so I think that was kind of um, not brought out to the forefront. Like maybe people even realize what was going on behind the scenes of how banged up that team was. Uh, so to win back to back, you know, people don't do that too often in the Big Ten. So to be able to do that uh, with the group that we had and the injuries that we had was, was very a proud moment for that team. And you know, that second one was just as sweet as the first one because we knew what we had been through that season. Uh, so at the end, that last game at Minnesota, when we were able to stay Big Ten champs again, it felt really, really good in that locker room. And the late, great Robert Archibald, what a season he had, Sean. Yeah. Becomes a second-round pick, really just um, took off that year. Um, what, what did he mean to that team? Because I know he's so important to all you guys and um, tragically passed away a couple of years ago. But uh, what a season he had, what a career he had. Yeah, he took off in the Arizona game the year, the, the last game of the season before that. And that's when everyone was excited for what Arch was going to bring, you know, that next year, his senior year. And um, we always say he's larger than life, you know, not just because of his figure, but because of his personality, uh, because of what he brought to the game. Um, he was so good at footwork, positioning himself before the catch, thinking a play ahead, uh, you know, not the most skilled, talented guy by any means, but the way that he was able to be productive inside was all of his preparation. It was all of his hard work. Um, and, you know, he was one of those guys that he was, you know, kind of the backbone of that team. Um, you know, really, like I said, larger than life. He had the personality, played hard, played physical, played tough. Uh, and we all kind of followed that lead. And, you know, just tremendous season that he had that senior year. Um, you know, probably a guy two years before people were probably saying he shouldn't even be in the big 10, you know, just kind of the way that he was. And then for the, him to go to have the year that he has his senior season uh, and then to go get drafted and, uh, you know, go play a couple of years in the league, all kinds of years overseas plays in the Olympics, uh, you know, the career that he ended up having, um, you know, was just phenomenal. And, um, you know, just, it, he was, he was a lot of fun to be around as, as well in practice. And you talk about keeping a guy, keeping it loose and keeping it, you know, uh, funny and upbeat in the locker room, you know, he could do that for you. Uh, and no shame losing to that Kansas team. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these, these were guys when I was first starting to get really get into college basketball. I was like, that was the day drew good. And Nick Hollis, yeah. and Kirk Heinrich, Aaron miles. Like that, that was a pretty dang good team. Yeah, no, they were really good. Yeah. Uh, Wayne Simeon, I think on that group yeah. as well. And so, I mean, you talk about the NBA talent that they ended up going uh, away with. And again, it's a, it's a possession game at the end. We have a chance to tie it or take the lead in, in the final minute. Uh, and we don't make the shot. We don't make the play. Um, but it, otherwise, it's back-to-back trips to the Elite Eight if we can hit one more shot or make one more play. And, um, uh, you know, the darn Cole Center just got us. We could not we could not win in the Cole Center. And we have to go and play the Sweet 16 in the Cole Center. So, um, but no, again, just terrific season. Um, you know, when you look back on it and, and really think, you know, making Elite Eight runs, making Sweet 16 runs, back-to-back Big Ten titles, you know, it's as good as a team and, and, and really, I believe to this day in Illinois history. And, uh, you know, we didn't have the final four to kind of put us in that category. Uh, but you look at, you know, I mentioned the 51 and two at home. You mentioned three out of four years winning the Big Ten, never lower than a four seed. So that stretch, that team was as good as anybody out there. And, and I'd put us up against anybody, you know, any given night as well. Well, the conversation is always 89 versus 05, right? Yeah, and yeah. this is a part I hate about college basketball. It's what we love about college basketball. Yeah. It's what we hate. It's a single elimination tournament. And, yeah. and oftentimes the best teams don't make it as yeah. far as they should. Like there's been, you know, Duke teams that, that lose in the first or second round or Kansas teams lose in the first or second round that are phenomenal teams that just yeah. didn't go as far. So they're not remembered as fondly. We kind of got a reminder of that last year. What a great team that was. But they just get the wrong matchup and, and don't play well one day, and all of a sudden you're out of it. But I feel like your team should be in that echelon. I mean, you just rattled off the stats. We've talked about them, Sean. Like, the, you had some of the best teams uh, in Illinois history. And if you guys played 89, you know, seven times, you might be able to beat them four times. Or if you play 05 seven times, you might be able to beat them in a series. Who knows? Those, those are fun conversations to have, but you guys certainly belong in, in that kind of conversation. Yeah, no, we're, we're really proud of, of that stretch, and we do feel like we're, we're as good. Uh, we're not taking anything away from 05 and 89. By us saying we're one of the best isn't saying they're bad. We're just saying we're right there with them. We believe that in our heart. Uh, we mentioned, you know, we're, you know, no one else can say they beat three of the four final four teams in one season. I, I'd be in that season, so it's probably hard to, like, find a team that did that. So we do believe that, you know, we're right up there. But it's also a, a reminder, too, to enjoy the journey. Yeah. You know, it's kind of what you talked about, even last year's team, like just the sour note that it ends on. That's why you have to enjoy the journey. And, um, you know, I think I one time put out on Twitter, would you rather have a team that wins the Big Ten and dominates for the whole season, but loses in the Sweet 16 in a tough matchup? Or would you rather have a team that finishes 500 in the Big Ten, gets to the final four, but loses that first game of the final four? And it's like 90% of the people want the yes. final four and, yeah. and they don't care that for the entire three, four months that they're watching that your team struggles. You're not winning many games. You're a eight, nine seed, maybe getting in, but you make this two week run. And that's why March madness is so special. Right. Uh, you know, and that's where teams are remembered. Uh, and that's why it's one of the best events in all of sports is because you get remembered for what you do in those two and a half weeks. Uh, and that's why it is very fun and special, but for fan bases, enjoy the ride. When you've got a good team, cherish it and, and, and you know, enjoy the experience because you just don't know how it's going to go at the end of the year. And, and it's, it's, it's one game away. It's a buzzer beater away uh, from, you know, the season being completely different, um, you know, at the end of the season. But it doesn't take away from those three, four months uh, that everybody did. And, and that's where I'm a big believer that a Big Ten regular season means more than a Big Ten tournament championship. And it's just you had to grind for three months to get the one. The other one, you had to play well for three games. And so there's, there's just kind of that difference. There's a different pride uh, when, when you win that regular season. And, and that's how it should be for fans to enjoy the regular season, enjoy the run that these guys go on uh, because it doesn't happen often. And, and, it, and it's hard to get teams that are going to, you know, be exciting throughout the whole year. Yeah. I think the measure of a good program is what they do in the conference, right? Mm-hmm. Year after year. And the fact that, Brad Underwood and Illinois have won the most conference games the last two years. And if they can continue that to make it a third year this year, I think that's a, that's a really good sign. Okay, Sean, I want, I do want to ask you about this team. We're 10 games in and obviously it's been disjointed, I I guess is the best word given suspension to Kofi, the injuries that have had this team, the flu bug that went through them. They're sitting at seven and three. Nobody thought uh, or wanted to be seven and three at this point, but what have you thought of this team through 10 games? 
yeah, I guess the question, who are they? You know what I mean? Like that's kind of, we haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen it. So I'm not worried about this group. You know, I, I, it's, I mentioned earlier, none of these games are going to cost you an NCAA tournament bid. None of these games might not even cost you a seed. Maybe you'll be a seed lower because you, you lost one of these games along the way. Um, I believe this is a very good team. I believe this is a Big Ten championship team. I believe this is a team that should be playing in the second weekend. And what we just talked about, who knows after that, right? I mean, it's, sometimes it takes a little bit of luck to get to that final four. Sometimes it takes a heartbreaker and you're out in that first weekend. So this is definitely a Big Ten championship caliber team. This is definitely a second weekend type team, maybe a final four if things go right. Could get knocked out early if things don't go right. Um, but I really like them. I mean, Kofi is, is dominant on the inside. I don't see anybody that can match up with them. Uh, Arizona showed a little bit of a stretch there to begin um, the second half where a couple block shots, they were playing them. It was the first time I really kind of seen somebody take it to Kofi, you know, in the entire, in really the last two years, to be honest. Um, so I'm not worried about him. He's going to, anytime you have a big guy like that, you're, you're not going to go in big scoring droughts. You should be able to get a bucket every couple minutes by getting it to him. Uh, Curbelo hasn't even played really this season yet. Um, you know, so you're still going to get him coming back into the mix. You love what you're getting out of Frazier. You love what we're getting out of Plummer right now. Uh, you know, so again, this is a team that, um, you know, we haven't seen the best of them. You know, we, re- we really haven't. They haven't played together yet. The turnovers concern me. That, that, that If I would say there was one thing right now that I would look, it's the turnovers. You can say some of that is right. The disjointed lineups, everyone not playing together. I just see some careless turnovers. I, I see some of that where that doesn't matter who's on the floor with you. That's, that's focus. That's maybe effort. That's reading a play. Um, it's not where I thought this guy was going to be here and I turned it over because we're not used to playing together. So they have to clean up some of the turnovers. I think that would be something that could, that could hurt them moving forward to, you know, to not win the big 10 championship would be because they have a couple games where they turn it over too much. And, and that gets them. Uh, they're shooting the ball extremely well from three right now. So you're not worried about that. Um, like I said, it's a balanced team. You can go inside, you can go out. I don't think we've seen the best of them. So I'm not worried about them right now, uh, you know, you, 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 but um, like I said, turnovers concern me. And then my biggest disappointment, Arizona is really good. My, my biggest disappointment in that one is you blow a 15 point lead at home. Yep. You know, and, and no matter how good the team is, if you're really good, you don't blow a 15 point lead at home. And, and again, I think a turnover and one starts that run in the first half. And again, it's, it's just a careless turnover. It's just a pass that goes the other way. It doesn't seem like much at the time, but Illinois is on a 20 or 21, the nothing run. And that's the play that turned the tide for the game. It was just one turnover. And at the time you kind of felt it. It's like, here was that run. And then there's an and one break out the other way. They couldn't score. And you give them a breakaway. So little things like that change games. Uh, so those are the things that I'd want to see cleaned up. If, if there's one concern right now, to me, it's still the turnovers are out there and they got to clean that up. Yeah. Ever since Kofi came back, I feel like this is a really good team and he's just a great equalizer, right? I mean, he's one of the best players in the country uh, and they shoot the lights out, right? Like that, that is for sure. Like they got four, four guys that can really, really shoot the ball from the outside. I think turnovers and maybe on ball defense are, are, are the biggest concerns uh, for me, Sean, if we're talking about them being a great team, because they're not a great team right now. Uh, and I think to be a great team, they probably need to clean up some of those things, but I think the sophomores, right? I think Coleman Hawkins, who has, uh, he's the one guy that can kind of be that four is going through expected growing pains. And then Andre Corbello, right? Like if he's on the court and he plays well, this team's ceiling goes much higher. So I feel like those are the two guys that if you want to be a great team, those guys are going to have to improve as the season goes along. And, and for Curbelo, it's just getting on the court. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, yeah, that's the biggest thing is he brings a different dynamic to the team, right? He takes them to that next level. Cause it's a little bit what we talked about. Frank Curbelo's that guy where like, he does things that nobody else on the team can do. You know, when he's not out there, they can make up for him. They, they can still score. They can still shoot the basketball. They can still get it inside to, to Kofi. They can still do a lot of the things they want, but he's the guy that nobody else can play like he does. So he gives you that different look. He gives you that different, um, you don't want to call him X factor because he's a really good player, but he, he, it's that different look that a team has to prepare for. Um, where when you talk about like a Frazier, you talk about a plumber, they're both shooters and they're both similar, right? So they're very hard to stop. It's not easy to stop, but you got a game plan. You could game plan for them a little bit where those are two guys. You could say, we're going to play them the same way we're going to chase them on screens we're going to never leave them we're going to 
deny them in the corners. So you could play two guys straight up. When Cabrello comes in, now you have to play the guards all differently. You can't say we're going to play all their guards the exact same way. Now, who has the ball? What situation? It's harder to game plan when he gets out there. So, you know, that's a huge key to get him back, uh, get him healthy. Um, the dynamic of this team changes when he's on the floor. Sean, as you look at the Big Ten, I think there's only three teams ranked, only one inside the top 20, and, and that's Purdue. And Purdue's a very, very good team. I, I do think Illinois Purdue's a very interesting matchup. Jaden Ivey's going to be difficult for Illinois. It's going to be difficult for anybody. But um, as you look at the Big Ten, how do you kind of stack this up at, at the top? Because it feels like maybe there's five teams that, that are going to be in the race at the end of this thing. Yeah. And, you know, Michigan's struggling right now. You know, you, you look at the way that they're playing, something's not right there. You know, they're, they're just, they're not clicking. We talked about again, they lost a lot of pieces, but you see some good pieces come back. So everyone maybe expects them to just kind of take off where they, you know, pick up where they left off. And that's not the case with them. Uh, I do believe Purdue's really good. Uh, it's the probably the one team in the country that I look at that if they lose a guy or two, they could still be a final four type team. You know, it, you just look at across the board there. Uh, obviously Ivy would probably be the one guy that would be a huge loss, but really everybody else on that team, they could lose one or two of those guys and they're so deep. I feel like they could be a final four team moving forward. Um, you know, they probably need all the pieces to be a national title, um, but they could lose a few guys. So I really do like them. I was shocked that they lost to Rutgers. I know Rutgers is, is it's a tough place to play. Um, maybe it's the number one ranking for the first time. Just how do you handle that? I mean, it, it's different. It's a different feel when, when you get that number one ranking. Um, you know, how do you handle that? So maybe that was playing with their minds a little bit. And they weren't quite ready for it. Uh, but Purdue is really good. I believe Illinois is really good. I, right now, those are the two best teams in the Big Ten. Um, if Michigan gets right, they're kind of still in that upper tier. Ohio State. Uh, is probably in that group. And then I think we have to kind of wait and see, you know, who else is going to kind of be in that mix right now uh, and, and kind of join the rest of those, the rest of those, uh, those two or three. But I do believe that Illinois and Purdue are the two best teams right now. I love that they play each other twice, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you're going to get an opportunity to go head to head with them. Um, but that's, you know, it's, it's early. I love seeing these early two games to kind of get a little bit of feel for everybody. But my takeaway is those are the two best teams. And then you kind of have the, that next tier of three, four teams that could they join the party late in the season. Sean Harrington, you're the goods man. Uh, appreciate all the time sharing stories about uh, two of the best teams in Illinois history going back to back there. And I'm glad you guys are having your day, man, to come back here 20 years. Does it feel that long ago? No, not at all. It's scary when you say that. So it, it, it's, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I guess I could go with that. But 20, 20 seems like an awful long time ago. It's, it's shocking that it went that fast. Well, safe travel, Sean, and always appreciate your time, man. Appreciate it. We'll see you guys in Champaign.